Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, welcome. We're really uh, pleased with this episode. I feel like it was such an interesting conversation we had uh, with us. Dr. Aaron Balick, and he is a psychoanalyst and has, uh, has special knowledge in the area of social media. And we've been talking about reactivity, projection, uh, the wounds and how we deal with those wounds and how sometimes we become very reactive in the face of those wounds and then how that all plays out on social media, especially in light of uh, global events of the past several weeks. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Dr. Balick. Um, he is a psychotherapist, a consultant, a cultural theorist, a public speaker, and an author. Drawing on more than 20 years of clinical and academic experience, Aaron is a leading voice in the public understanding of psychology and how it can be directly applied to benefit individuals, organizations, and society. And he's the author of the book, The Psychodynamics of Social Networking. And he has also written two self-help books, The Little Book of Calm and Keep Your Cool, which was written for children. So we really appreciated having him on, and we think you're going to enjoy this conversation. So Aaron, uh, you and I actually know each other um, from Twitter, which is, which is interesting because I think we're going to wind up talking a little bit today about the ills of social media, or, or at least some of the dangers of social media, maybe. But of course, you know, it also does this wonderful thing like connect me with interesting people. Um, and uh, I saw you posted this really terrific, interesting blog post in the past several days about reactivity. And I just so appreciated that. And I know you, you, you have an expertise in uh, social media and you've, you've written a book about that. And um, it just seemed like a good time to invite you onto the podcast because reactivity, I think, is a real, a real mm. issue out there. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm a big fan of the podcast, so it really Aww. ticks a lot of boxes for me. Um, <laughs> so thank you. And and it's nice to start with that warmth, because that is right. You know, you, mm -hmm. we came into each other's purview on, on Twitter, which I continue to call it for a variety of reasons. <laughs> yeah, uh, which has changed, you know, since those days. I think it's, it is a less nice place. Um, but there is, there is a place for social media. Um, but I have really struggled with it myself. So, you know, since the events on October 7th, knowing how inadequate it is at dealing with complexity mm -hmm. and knowing how reactive it can make people and knowing that it almost completely lacks nuance, I was kind of on the one hand um, frozen because I didn't mm -hmm. know what to do. I felt like, I felt a little bit like I ought to say something about it. I was tweeting the regular sorts of things and on my Instagram, you know, kind of just not mentioning it at all mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I just didn't want to step in. And then I ended up sort of just putting a note up saying, um, don't, don't interpret my silence on this, a silence about the issue. I've just identified that social media isn't where I want to share it. Mm -hmm. And then that pernicious impulsivity started to seep in, right? So I started getting angry and I started reading things and I wanted to comment and I didn't know how to comment. So started commenting about the process itself, you know, about Twitter mm -hmm. in the context of global events. Um, and that blog post that you read was the second in that period where what was going on social media just really forced me to think yet again about what it's doing particularly when there is intensive conflict and with this conflict, how it plugs into 
to use probably the words more familiar with the, you guys, <laughs> but um, some really kind of archetypal moments in in our history, which I think is why it's so fundamentally activating. Mm. Mm. So what do you what do you think it's doing? How do you understand well, its role? <laughs> Sadly, I think it's polarizing and dividing at the moment. And so, so what is it doing, I think, is a really good question, right? What is it doing and why do we go and use it? And I think people aren't asking that question. That's a question I've been asking myself a lot, right? So why would I go on to Twitter? And mm -hmm. I think how people are going on to Twitter is because they're very angry and they're saying, this is how angry I am. And then mm -hmm. they're evidence gathering and saying, see, this is why I'm angry. And yeah. then posting really distressing and disturbing videos, you know, really distressing clips of news, almost like doubling down on the fury. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a catharsis guy. You know, I, I did my bit of, um, <laughs> I did my bit of gestalt back in the day, but sort of, you know, getting your anger out, I don't think is particularly <laughs> productive. So there might be a sense of, um, you know, people say, well, at least it's being vented, but I, I don't think at least it's being vented. I think that venting is toxic and contagious. And then other mm -hmm. people start venting on one side or the other. And, and I think it's mostly not necessarily entirely, but mostly destructive. Mm -hmm. Not entirely for everything, right. But around this, around what's going on in the Middle East right now, it feels like it's having a destructive role. I think it often has a destructive role. I mean, I, I appreciated your your use of the word emotional, your phrase, emotional contagion in that blog mm. post. And I, I do think, I mean, first of all, emotion is incredibly contagious, right? Like this is, this is not speculative. We have a, we have a ton, I mean, I think we all know this. And then there's also a ton of research about it and it's a whole field of study. And, and, and there's, I believe, and you can fill me in if I'm getting this wrong, but I believe there's quite a bit of research about uh, how social media is a kind of vector of emotional contagion. There was an interesting study done a number of years ago with Facebook, I believe, you know, that, that if you're kind of reading all these posts where your friends are distressed or whatever, your, your mood actually goes down. Um, yeah. So, you know, that, that's, a really, that's a really important thing to know. And to me, it hooks in with Jung's ideas about what he would call mass psychology, which he was incredibly distrustful of. And I, you know, I, I mean, first of all, Jung was a real introvert, so it makes sense that he was not, uh, you know, a big fan of sort of mass events, but also kind of where he lived. I mean, he lived through World War I. He lived through World War II. He saw how incredibly destructive um, kind of mass psychology can be and uh so i don't think he had anything good to say about it but he did write quite a bit about how we get swept along on an emotional current and how there is a kind of lowering of a level of consciousness you know he did not think that kind of mob psychology uh was a very uh kind of elevated uh space <laughs> Or discourse or nuance and I, I i try to imagine what he would have to say about twitter yeah maybe there is no wisdom in crowds <laughs> i think yes, i think there yeah. is a point in uh yeah i mean the thing is it's regressive right so so it, it yeah did you want to say something deb no i th i i'm listening to what you're both saying and i find it all incredibly uh, distressing because your word uh, regressive for me hits the mark. Uh, it, it takes us back to just a very simple emotional reactive stances and um, a simplification that is contrary and blocks any possibility of actual understanding. Yeah. Uh, and the, how do we get from reactivity to response that's nuanced, that can understand context, and is willing to engage complexity r rather than what you talk about, this binary thinking of that's wrong, that's bad, and I'm outraged? Well, see, I think the 
the problem is it takes it takes us to do that and mm. it feels less good to do that right because you're not venting you're not splitting you're not defended you you get you don't get to be as righteous right so um yeah. i find and I, I don't use a lot of Melanie Klein, but I, I find Melanie's, <laughs> Melanie Klein's positions quite helpful in this, you know, that the regressed position is the paranoid right. schizoid position, right? So that is right. the split position, idealized or debased, right? And you flip from one to the other. And Can you, no, then wait, the depressive... Just, um, wait, yeah. I love this, because okay. <laughs> I, I love Melanie, I love these two, but we have a general audience here, so you have to explain... Yes. Who yes. Melanie Klein is and what the yeah. paranoid schizoid state like. Let's let's do this because this is really this is good stuff. Got it. If somebody but wants just, to hear about paranoid schizoid with me, I'm very happy to go. Into that okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. here for this. So basically, so Melanie Klein was an early psychoanalyst. You know, around the the Freud and Anna Freud set in the early days. Um, ended up in here in England. Um, and so I won't go into the whole, you know, the, that whole thing, but basically she was among the very first to look at child psychology and developmentally, she had these two positions that she called them. And the first one was about zero to about eight or nine months. And the second one was about nine months onward. But as adults, we flip between these two positions and so we would regress to the earlier position. And the first position she's called the paranoid schizoid position. And this is related to in her mind, and lots of people think this is really crazy stuff because she has a very imaginative mind that a child might experience that we know cognitively children don't do anymore, but it's a, you have to see it as a metaphor. Right. And in a sense, she said that the child's relationship with the breast um, becomes, the, the breast becomes idealized when it's present and it's warm and it's providing milk. And when it's not there, it becomes, in a sense, demonized because it becomes this withholding breast right the the mother's not there the baby is hungry and crying and the whole world falls apart the breast comes it's the most wonderful thing in the world and everything is fine and safe and until the baby is able to understand that the breast that's there is the same breast that isn't there which we came to understand mm -hmm. as object constancy right you can keep that breast or that mother in your head even when she's not around then you move into depressive position and what boggles everybody's mind is like, why is the depressive position mm -hmm. a, a better one? It doesn't sound very good, right? And that's because you also lose the ideal, right? So you lose the hellish mm -hmm. version, but you also lose the ideal breast because it's the one that's sometimes not there when you want it to be there. So you have to give something up in order to move into the depressive position. And it's paranoid schizoid because schizoid means split. So the good breast is not the same thing as the bad breast. And paranoid is it, it's not just that it's not there, but almost like it's not there on purpose. Like it's there, yes. it, it's not there to get you, right? So you split <laughs> it off and then it becomes nasty. Mm. And when we are challenged as adults, when we're reactive in that Kleinian model, we move from the depressive position into the paranoid schizoid mm -hmm. position. So to say, as I said in that blog post, um, that this the the secretary general of the United Nations gets pilloried for saying we must understand why acts of terrorism happen. That's a very depressive position to take, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just there's no context. This is just bad. Let's bomb them all, right? It's like this was a heinous act, and we need to understand, just like we do in psychology and psychoanalysis, right? We always want to understand mm -hmm. what the symptoms are arising from. The paranoid schizoid response is, how dare you understand? Mm -hmm. Right. There's no gray area. There's no depressive area. And that's that. So, so social media, particularly short form like Twitter, I think is largely a paranoid schizoid enabling platform. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. actually it's very difficult to bring people into depressive through the platform. So to kind of roundabout answer your question, Deb, it's like it has to be in forms like this, like forums that enable person to person small scale mm -hmm. impactful conversations is where depressive positioning happens you mm -hmm. can't do it i don't know a way to do it on the mass scale i certainly don't know how to do it when it's being mediated through through social media it seems to me that the part of the regression is uh as with a baby everything is related to the me you know what gratifies me if i get what i want to be held Fed, sung to, um, 
versus stepping away from just the me to being able to consider context, to be able to consider the position of the other doesn't mean I have to agree with it, but at least to have a little distance between my ego and my feelings and a wider context, which is what we hope kids achieve, you know, as they realize, oh, gee whiz, mom is just a person. And sometimes yeah. things don't go well, but most of the time it goes pretty well. Uh, but it seems like we lose that very quickly and very, very easily. So it's, it's really interesting that you bring ego into it because part of what I talk about in my book, The Psychodynamics of Social Networking, is how social networking, not all of it, but much of it is an ego based, and I mean that in the technical sense and not necessarily yeah. narcissistic, but an I based mm -hmm. function. And it's not just an ego function, it's, it's kind of an exposed outward ego. So, you know, the technical idea is that the ego looks inward and mediates one's own feelings and one's internal life, mm -hmm. makes assessments about the out external world and mediates between those two things. But when you go on social media, it's like that tipping out part, the part that's looking at everybody else and showing up for everybody else is amplified because that's the nature of the platform, right? It's, it's kind of performative. It's um, public. It's an ego expression. Mm. So not only does that mean that you're, you might be looking in a little bit less because you're so hypervigilant to how you're being perceived or what you want to express, but the ego is also the psychic body that does defense, right? <laughs> it wants yes. to protect itself from being wrong, right? Or from even from being um, perceived uh, in a complex way, you know, because it, it, it wants to be okay. So you're out there, you're amplifying that out there-ness and you're defensive while you're out there because you're so invested in how you're showing up in a particular way. And social media does that so well because it's it's about gesture right it's it's not about complexity yeah. it's about saying i'm with or i'm against that's mm -hmm. what it can handle um that you really get stuck in a, an identification with the outward facing part of the ego which is amongst the most vulnerable and defended part of ourselves which obviously can also launch into attack you know attack often comes from vulnerability not just you mm -hmm. know, aggression Wow, there's just so much in there. <laughs> there's like all these points I want to unpack, but but maybe just um, to 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 be with that 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 kind of defendedness for a second. You know, one of the things about the depressive position, which I love how you explained that. By the way, that was just so clear and <laughs> so great. Thank you. And nice to revisit Melanie Klein with her very expressive, uh, colorful metaphors. But um, one of the things about the depressive position is that uh, we have to give up the fantasy of omnipotence. And, uh, you know, I think that that is um, that that kind of fantasy of omnipotence goes along with uh, outrage. You know, that's a kind of inflated state to put it in some Jungian language a little bit um, to, to recognize that uh, you know, be, being being very angry makes us feel puffed up. It makes us feel big. It makes us feel mm -hmm. it makes us feel safe. So I think there's something about outrage that makes us feel safe, and and it is very much in that kind of paranoid schizoid place. Yeah. And yeah, and and I think that that safeness when you you know, and then you bring in projection, right, and probably all sorts of other tools as well I won't go yes. into because we've got enough on on the table right but mm -hmm. you you protect yourself by in a sense putting all the bad stuff out there right so mm -hmm. they are the bad people we are fine and then there's this kind of and I, I say the we too because then we have the algorithms right so then we have the filter bubbles so the 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 social media goes and then creates this um a kind of automated confirmation bias in in a sense mm -hmm. um you're exposed yeah. to the other side but you're also you know you get a lot of feedback from you know from the split the split pieces if that makes any sense right mm -hmm. uh, so uh yes i forgot where i was going with that but that's um <laughs> well, yeah so, there so are the, many places yeah, to, to go. denigrate the other <laughs> yeah it's to make one righteous and i think the righteousness is another is another feature right mm -hmm. yeah definitely 
all the bad stuff is over there. I'm for all the good stuff. I, I do want to say, I mean, not, I'd like to dip back into the depths mm. in a minute, but I, I do just want to quickly say that I, I, I think I have a partial answer to how we have conversations like this on social media, which is to avoid pronouncements, but to share long form writing. So, for example, I think, I think that is a blog post, which I found on Twitter, really <laughs> yes. helped me think more about this. But I had to click on it and then spend, you know, 10 or 15 minutes reading it. So I had to slow down. I couldn't just react really quickly to some mm -hmm. uh, emotional uh, uh, statement that someone made. I had to slow down. I had to read it. It's not a light read. It's it's well worth reading. No, but, it's quite, you know, quite long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that required me to go from reactivity to response and to engage and to try to understand. Even if I didn't agree with everything you said, I was thinking, huh? Well, that's really interesting. So that's my that's my yes. But you had hot to, take. you had to choose that, right? So mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think like so things like Twitter can be really great for signposting, right? So I'm not going to go mm -hmm. into nuance here, but I'm going to signpost you to where there's yes. some room for nuance, which is. Mm -hmm what both of those blog posts were about. But you had to choose not just to click it, but to read it, you know, because mm -hmm. oftentimes they're reshared and people are saying, great. And actually there were some people that had reshared it. I thought you definitely didn't read the first one because if you had, you probably wouldn't have reshared it, right? Mm -hmm. So right. you, Lisa, had to make the choice to be impacted by what I wanted to say. And mm -hmm. maybe some of that capital was earned because we were on Twitter and we've encountered each other's content there. So maybe that's a plus for it. But I think on the platform itself, it's still very hard to find a way that it can help us do that, right? Without, yeah. in a sense, leave it. It helps us be reactive. It doesn't really help us say, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> let me ponder that, you know, other person's point of view that makes me feel quite activated for a little while rather than type off a quick response. That's It, it feels like... Uh one of the dilemmas here is how do we, as human beings, uh, overcome our essential wiring? You know, uh, we are wired for emotional reactivity. If you're sitting in a movie theater in the summer in sandals and somebody steps on your toe, uh, accidentally trying to get past you to another seat, you're going to yelp, stand up, and go, hey, you know, what's, what are you doing? So how do, and the social media is exacerbating by its very nature, our tendency to be reactive. So how do we n notice our feelings, name the feeling, and then move into a, a more reflective uh, and choiceful responsive space? That's a lot to ask. It is, and, and, and it's an uphill battle, right? Yeah. It's a tall order. It's an uphill battle. We're swimming against the stream. I don't know how many more uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> cliches metaphors. I want to bring in. But um, yeah, uh, the metaphor that works for me and has worked for me for a long time is the fast food metaphor and kind of linking <laughs> it to evolutionary psychology, right? So it used to be that we would have to run around, right, and capture this animal, right, take it to pieces, share it, save it to get everything we need, that fat, that protein, that carbohydrate, right? You can get all of that in a bacon double cheeseburger, you know, which I'm <laughs> a fan of every now and then, right? <laughs> but not only do you get everything that you need without working for it, like today with a smartphone, you can just press a button. There's not even an exchange of value that you can see. And then you can have that bacon cheeseburger come to your door immediately, right? So the bar to access what we're evolutionarily mm -hmm. leaning into, you know, our first step is super, super low, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the bacon double cheeseburger isn't such a terrible thing to have now and then, but you can't live on it, right? And the problem isn't so much that social media offers us relational donuts, I call them. So it's like the fast food of relationality, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? That's great. It's just, you can't live off that. It's fine to like engage with it, right? But then have the real conversations elsewhere. But it's the same problem, Deb, right? It's like, yeah. 
you've got to, you know, if you're comfort eating, if you're not exercising, you're living off bacon cheeseburgers, nobody's going to do it for you. You just Sunday realize how miserable you're feeling and you think I need to be eating healthier food and exercising and contravening every biological desire in my body mm -hmm. to, you know, eat a salad. Well, maybe I'm speaking for myself <laughs> more than others, but <laughs> we're set to be negatively biased by evolution. We are set to be more aware of those that are against us than those that are for us. We are set to regress to making subjects objects when we're under threat. So the, what we have to bring to bear ourselves is hard because it works against that programming. And I think the first step is realizing how sick it makes you feel. And I think that's, I think some people are beginning to do that, that they get the doom scrolling, that they get the sense of nausea and overload and decide I need to come away from this. I've been thinking since the start of our conversation about the idea of affective ventilation versus a kind of hyper aroused inflammation. And that in order for us to actually vent our emotions, there has to be another person who's co-regulating. Mm. If we go to our analyst and we're distraught, we don't want the analyst to start screaming with us <laughs> or planning the demise of our enemy, you know, and yes. really cheering us on. Much like that parental relationship that you were leaning into, Deb, we need mm -hmm. the other to be giving us full attention and to be regulating themselves in a way that we can't find so that the fire actually dies down. So we still have that impulse to bring our distress somewhere. But there's something missing, of course, in social media. There, there isn't a regulated other who's making eye contact. And I think more importantly, when we think about it culturally, there is a lack of an internal other that even whatever people are fantasizing uh, Twitter is, or fantasizing that Facebook is, there doesn't seem to be an adequate internal representation as if they were speaking to an other that is co-regulating them. So there's societally a missing piece that has to do with the, the great problem of alienation mm. in the culture. So I take your meaning that we're constantly self-stimulating or we're in a fantastical, inflammatory mm. place. What puts the brakes on mm. anywhere? And I think what you're saying is there's a, an object relations problem that's going on inside of people, and then therefore the ego has to stand up in its place. And the example that I would use is once in a while I'll have an analysand who had um, an absent primary caregiver or perhaps mom was wildly mentally ill, and then later on in life, they exhibit strange behaviors like not brush their teeth, although they could be wildly successful in other realms, because there isn't an internal figure that's reminding them, well, take care of yourself. Mm. It's time to go to bed, or you have to brush your teeth, mm. or you have to take a shower. And so consequently, the ego has to step in and has to decide to do those self-caring and regulatory processes so again, in that larger sense, there's something missing in, inside of Western culture that I think we're seeking when we're going on to social media in all its ways. We're seeking an other, and the absence of that makes us wildly vulnerable to this hyper-arousal. And saying all of that, I'm not sure what the solution might be. Yeah. Because there's so many implications for that. Well, I've got like three, three things bouncing around. Let me just get them out and you can kind of choose <laughs> which one. So the, it's very, it's, it's stimulated me because uh, I'm thinking about that. Like I make a distinction between recognition and validation. So recognition is what you're talking about. So good enough recognition from the primary caretaker enables one to build an ego that can recognize itself and make those kinds of decisions about brushing teeth, right? We're coming off the social media. So, you know, if you're starting from, um, say, a, a privileged position of having had good enough recognition, um, you, don't, you don't need it. You, you don't fall into a, a narcissistic requirement, right? You're less likely to fall into a narcissistic requirement, which comes from 
the wound of not having recognition, right? It's not about self-love. It's about feeling empty inside and needing. And when people go to social media, they get validation often, but they don't get recognition. You can only get, and that's just like a surface level thing, right? It's just a like, a share, more followers. Mm -hmm. That's the donuts, right? That's the one thought. The second thought is this thing about um, subjects and objects. So from the social brain theory, I don't know if you've heard of um, Dunbar's number. He's come up with this idea that um, we, we pretty much have room for about 150 relationships in our brain. So people that you know enough that you could basically trust them or not trust them, right? You lent them food last winter, you run out of food this coming winter, you can trust enough that they're going to lend you food, right? It's sort of a hunter-gatherer era kind of a thing. We can, we can sustain about 150 complex enough relationships. So when you're on social media, obviously there are thousands. So that subject relating becomes object relating. It's just too many to be able to retain that mm -hmm. state. And the third thing I'm afraid has now left my mind, but maybe it will, it will come back again. It was a validation in the Dunbar's yeah. number. What that takes me to is, um, you know, how human beings have gone from, you know, hunter-gatherer, small societies, villages where, you know, we, we all kind of know who's who in, in our village. Uh, to cities and city states and nations and empires, where what seems to be the glue that holds it all together is a belief system. The belief might be democracy, it might be, you know, some sort of imperative from the deity uh, to do this or that or the other. It might be, uh, you know, lots of different things. And I'm wondering if if there is any sort of governing mythology that that underlies social media, the kind of connectivity, um, any kind of morality uh, that, that people have as a common understanding, or is it just a free for all? <laughs> <laughs> So I remembered my third thing, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can think it. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the the third thing Joseph asked, you know, is there is there can there be an internalized other in in mm -hmm. this? And, and, and in a sense, in a sense, when you have someone like Elon Musk running Twitter, like li li literally a, a reactive person running a platform, that's very very problematic. That's what makes it more problematic than it was. So I just mm -hmm. want to say that out loud so we don't lose number three from the previous question. And Deb, I think, I think the problem is, and we'll kind of be talking about identity a little bit here, because I think it would be great if there were like a Joseph Campbell-esque, you know, mytheme that we could all share that would unite us through something like social media. And I think essentially there is. I really do think that it is a lot to do with the fault in the platforms, that actually platforms can be developed to, to increase togetherness more than oh. they currently do. I, I do have a hope for that. But I think people have their own stories, and those stories are about identities, and I think that's why this issue around Israel and Palestine is so mm -hmm. emotive, because particularly today, in 2023, when we are more aware than ever of race, religious difference, um, colonialism, um, uh, injustice, um, white privilege, right? Like all of this kind of set, like if you want to find one issue that ticks off all of the emotive issues in today's world where people have a real beef, like I, I think a real right to have a beef with the consequences of, you know, post-colonialism, but the consequences of colonialism. And then it's like here, this has all the elements, right? So rather than moving to kind of a universally shared story where there are, mm -hmm. you know, oppressors, um, there, there are oppressors and victims in time contextual, contextualized situations and that you know, it goes back and forth and, you know, we can go way, way back to find that. It becomes this one's story, one's preferred story of injustice, in a sense, that one is identified with and then collects all of the evidence to double down on that story. And I think often that's a personal story that's then projected onto a global story. 
which is also harmful because in some ways it means you forget the actual people on the ground who are suffering from what's mm -hmm. happening because you're so involved in your identification with that suffering from your own. And they're not mutually exclusive things, but I think that's what's so activating about it, right? So if you feel that you have been oppressed, and if you feel that you have been oppressed, particularly in a post-colonial world, and you see what's going on there, then you're going to have a very strong, very righteous story about that. And that's going to inform everything. And while I think essentially bare bones, those things are shared or should be shared in some kind of a way, because that's just the experience of humanity. And I think we can mm. all look back ancestrally and find evidence, you know, on both sides sounds quite haphazard and dumb, but I think you know what I'm kind of getting at. We can find evidence of, you know, aggression and victimization. Um, we're really stuck in an incapacity to work through the very real consequences of all that stuff because we're just continuing the repetition of the split narrative. Maybe that, that sounded a little bit jumbled, but I think it's in short, it's like a, dis, it's like a, it's like a, a, a shattering of narratives that aren't mm -hmm. melding rather than a grand narrative. Yeah. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I, I think, uh, here's how I heard what you said you can correct me if I'm, if I'm off base, but, um, <clears throat> uh, gosh, how to, how to lean into this. Y you know, I remember, um, Chloe Valdery once who we've had on the podcast, she said something on Twitter. <laughs> she said something, but I, I really, I appreciated it and remembered it. She said something like, when are we going to acknowledge that we've all oppressed and victimized each other? Something like that. That unfortunately, this goes along with being human. You know, that, that groups at, at various times, you know, that, that this is just, if you're a student of history, I mean, people have just been awful to each other throughout history. Not, not that we shouldn't try to do better. Of course we should. And I do believe in a kind of evolution of norms and even an evolution of consciousness. But, but that narrative of... Um, difference rather than a narrative of universality kind of perpetuates the problem. And, um, and, and I also was really resonating with what you said about how we project our own story onto global events. Uh, so that, you know, sometimes we have a very deep unconscious hurt that might not be any, you know, it might not be related in any salient way to global events, but, but that's what gets awakened in us in this emotional reactivity. And then we're, we're kind of in this moment of identification mm -hmm. with something that we're not even really understanding that that's what we're doing. So we're, I think, moving into the territory of projection a little bit. And the timing is interesting, right? Because I, I, I wrote a paper a while back when the Ukraine war was coming out and looking at how that was being expressed over Twitter. And I can't remember the full title, but I kind of used the phrase careful culture in there. And what I noticed happening is that people on Twitter anyway were, you know, um, vocally voicing support for Ukraine. And there was a lot of attack um, about how, you know, why... It was, it was, the accusation was basically, this is happening in Europe, this is happening to white people, and you should be upset about all the stuff that's going on in the world all the time, why Ukraine, right? So in a move for solidarity with Ukraine, people were being attacked for not having expressed solidarity for a whole series of other causes, right? Mm -hmm. And I found this really problematic because here in the UK, I mean, I remember um, before the Iraq war, um, being part of a million person march to prevent in invading from Iraq. And I was thinking, well, I know very well that that's not true because there were a million of us there who didn't want to go into a non-European country. So I felt like the, the thing that was being seen on the one hand was being equated, where I said that the, the, the support for Ukraine was being equated with global injustice and the way in which uh, mainstream media prefers European causes and all that stuff, right, righteous um, criticism 
but it's all kind of, it gets tightly wound together, right? And now we have the situation in the Middle East where lots and lots of people in Europe are, are up in arms about what's going on in Palestine, directly contradicts the criticism about the people that were standing behind Ukraine, right? So it can't be true that if you stand for in solidarity with Ukraine, that you're not standing in solidarity with other things. You just might not mm -hmm. be aware of those things as much. And a lot of people are aware of Palestine. They're less aware of Myanmar. So it's, it's not a fault that there's mm -hmm. no, not enough sensitivity for Myanmar, right? It's just like, I, right. if it's local to you, if you know about it, you're more likely to be involved, right? But on social media, it becomes yet more evidence of global and, you know, post-colonial global inequity, which I think is really what's being worked through a lot of that kind of accusation. And because the platform is gesticular, because it's a gesture, because you're putting a Ukrainian flag or a Palestinian flag or an Israeli flag, it doesn't say anything about your activism. You know, you could be doing all sorts of stuff, right, all around the world, but somebody's seeing the gesture, they're making the symbolic equation of the gesture with global injustice and then perhaps attacking you. Well, it happens exactly the other way around, the other way around as well. You know, how can you stand for this when they did this? And, you know, then you're back into paranoid schizoid again. So I'm wondering if that might be a thread that runs through it. I'm, I'm back on uh, your statement about shattering the narrative, you know, the splitting, the binary thinking. And, and you know, so I'm trying to think, okay, uh, what... Is there something, a substrate here? And maybe uh, the substrate, at least possibly, is a concern about inequity, a concern about injustice, and a desire for unity, a desire for, you know, some something that would be more, more uniting. And uh, that, that underneath it, that that's, you know, what the wish is, the wish is, and we don't know how to get it. We, we don't know how to achieve that because it gets so concretized that you're on one side versus the other. It's out there. Uh, so really you have to take a side. That's really beautifully put. I, I think you're right. Yeah. And I think that was really like, I'm, I feel quite touched by you saying that because I feel oh. like w what you're talking about is a wound, right? You're talking yes. about a wound of injustice, right? Yes. And a will to heal all, yeah. under all that shit that's flying around yes. is a wound to heal. But you have to get past blame. And there's a lot of blame, like, a lot of blame, you know? And I think about, mm -hmm. you know, a married couple or a, or an unmarried couple, a couple, right? And one of them has an affair, and then the couple has to recover from that affair. At some stage, if you want to recover from that affair, you're, you're going to have to relinquish blame, even if the bad stuff was done, right? If, if you're going to recover. Yeah. And I think it's very hard to recover, sorry, to relinquish blame. And I'm not suggesting that can happen in this moment, <clears throat> you know, with what's going on. It's, it's you know, you, this isn't the moment, right? This is, this is a very different moment. But if there's going to be a progress, it's getting in touch with exactly what you're describing, which is a will, a, an acknowledgement of being wounded, mm -hmm. an acknowledgement of a will to heal, so much so that you're willing to have a seat at the table and start from today, because, you know, we can't start in 1948, we can't start in 1933, right? We can't start in AD one, you know, which this, this, uh, before that, right? Like, or AD 70 or whatever, you know, we have to acknowledge just as we've done. Well, we haven't done it particularly well. Um, you know, the, what, what our countries are and, and what they emerged from and how we understand what we've inherited through, you know, through history. You can't take it back, but you have to. You have to start from today at some point, and I think that requires mm -hmm. so much. It's hard to go to the feelings of that people hurt, people are wounded. It's hard, and there's it's, so often loss under anger, isn't there? And we know this yeah. from therapy. You, you sit yeah. with that anger and you say, what's under that anger? And almost invariably, mm -hmm. these deep tears of loss arrive, right? 
And I think the hard part, uh, you know, certainly in the consulting room, around really feeling the grief and the loss, uh, is that we feel helpless, you know, that, that, that this is what happened. So something awful really happened, whether it's an, yeah. a, a marriage or a force of nature or financial reversal or a hundred things. Uh, and and we can't do anything about it. As you say, we have to start from today. Uh, and feeling the helplessness and the confusion uh, of all those uncomfortable feelings versus um, righteous wrath against, yeah. I'm going to get the government, they're going to pay for this, or you know, whoever that other might be in such a scenario. Anger is activating. Now I feel better. I feel more powerful. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm back in my ego, and it's delusional, but I feel like I can do something about it. Yeah. And then what happens? You create the context for the next repetition of the breakdown, right? Then yes. the pendulum swings exactly. So what, what you need, I guess, maybe Joseph, you were asking a little bit about this, and we've been searching for it. You know, in a sense, symbolically, you need an adult, right, who can mediate. Right. Where are the grown -ups? So, who can who says <laughs> yeah you know like you do like you do in you know really good group therapy really good couples work really good individual work where you're actually mediating just between the superego and the ego or whatever you want to call it right and sadly we really have very few adults now i mean they're not really mm -hmm. adults in charge and that's yeah. very scary too because nobody's you know and it's very difficult and i'm not a you know i, I can't speak for global society in the way I can for individual psychotherapy, right? But you need a figure who can hold the depressive position for others, mm. right? Who says, I'm not going to satisfy your bloodlust with mm -hmm. bombs right now. And, and the fury that that will produce and the pressure, the person who identifies when you've had a pattern over and over and over again and you're sick of it, well, we're just going to bomb them, and they're going to bomb. We're, no, we're just producing a whole new generation of people to to hate us, right? Like, okay, this was heinous, but we really need to stop and rethink. And you know, sadly, sadly, we don't have a figure figure so, like that. It's very difficult in the global situation. It it is, and as you were talking, I was um, thinking that there there is one adult in the room all the time which is the dream maker, mm -hmm. that from a Jungian standpoint, that there is a corrective equilibrating impulse at the center of the personality that is trying to come forward in this kind of symbolic place. Whether or not that's dismissed or minimized, of course, is one of the challenges. But I do think that dreams are trying to compensate from these massive deficits, whether that's brought on by the culture or circumstance or character disorders, there is constantly a, a corrective process. Why that does or doesn't have enough impact is always interesting to me. I mean, every night we're getting these little corrective slaps on the wrist. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Why they work or don't work is always interesting to me in one sense. That, that said, I wanted to take just a little bit of a pivot because um, we're talking a lot about the content that shows up in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all these different platforms, and how the ego can develop attitudes in order to evaluate the veracity of the content or self-regulate in our own fantasies that are evoked by images and content. But I've been sitting here asking myself, what is the archetype that makes us even want to use Twitter or Facebook, <laughs> etc.? And I found myself thinking about the archetype of gossip, which is ancient. And in its most harmless sense, you know, everybody going to the river to to wash the clothes. And there's no formal mechanism for news or even 
information about the community or whether it's danger or entertainment, there is something really deep inside of us that wants to get together and, and gossip in a way. <laughs> and I was, um, <laughs> while we were chatting, I was looking at the etymology of the word gossip. So it wasn't easy to be. And, uh, you know, it comes from the word uh, God sibling, which really means God parent. And so the, the feeling is that, um, that we would come together in these informal family networks and, and share news and speak in this kind of familiar way. So there is something inside of us that does want to pretend that we're kind of coming to the fence between neighbors with coffee and gossiping about the things that are happening in the world. And I don't know that um, that's good or bad, but I think it's ancient and it's an impulse. <laughs> so it speaks to a need, I think, that, um, again, this kind of alienation in the culture has produced. Um, I, I don't know anybody who can take a cup of coffee over to their neighbor once a day and sit down and gossip with your buddy. I mean, that's all just kind of disappeared. So that impulse, I think, goes underground and is seeking some form of expression. Mm -hmm. So when something like Twitter pops up and says, you know, here it is. This is your uh, 20 minutes of chatting with your neighbor mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. It tickles something very, very deep inside of us that is um, not inherently good or bad, but it is, I think, a primal need. I th well, well I that's think really interesting, sorry. Joseph, because I'll just say quickly that um, gossip you know, part of the function of gossip, it's been theorized, is to sort of um, police norms. So someone, you know, your neighbor buys, uh, you know, a, a super fancy car or something, and everyone's, you know, gossiping about how gauche that is or something. So, so and there is a way that that is exactly what these platforms do, is kind of police norms about what you're allowed to say or think or that kind of thing. And in a way that I think is kind of destructive, but that's like maybe for another podcast. But what were you going to say, Aaron? But something, something very similar that I, I think gossip has a, it, it has a defensive quality, right? So you get your team around you to kind of like get at the other yeah. person and get agreement on. But I think to bring it back to the, the Dunbar's number thing, I think if you are in a, in a um, community of 150 or fewer people, and anybody who lives in a small village will, will know this, or even a small community. Um, gossip is regulated by personal knowledge as well, right? So you might hear that this person's got, yeah, you know, they've got a, a new car, right? Um, but you might also know that um, they donate like half of their earnings to some sort of charity or do like loads of volunteer work and that they just have a thing, you know, like you would regulate through personal knowledge that gossip. Mm -hmm. And that's so I think Twitter has one element of that, which is the the defensive news spreading um, othering quality without the knowing that would regulate it in a smaller, a smaller community. But I, I'd like to um, be willing to lift the malice out of the archetype of gossip. Um, because if we think about it in ancient communities, it could take you five years to figure out that a war might have happened in another part of the country. So gossip is an infirm, in an informal news network where people aren't necessarily always looking to wound each other. Mm. They're also just talking about the news, that this happened and that person did this and, and this person became ill and and uh, this person is doing one thing or another. So I think if we, if we were to take the intent for malice out, then I think it becomes just a little bit more interesting. Well, I just what is it that we I'm need as saying, human beings? Yeah, I'm not implying malice. And, and this is actually a kind of social science theory about gossip. It's not, I mean, <laughs> actually norms need to be policed. And mm -hmm. and I don't I agree with you. I think another function of gossip is just exchange of information. Mm -hmm. So it's just an aspect of gossip that there's a kind of mm -hmm. um, uh, policing of norms. But I don't actually necessarily see that as malicious. I I, I think there's some mm -hmm. utility to it. 
Sure, but I think we're concerned about the malicious part of it. Yes, yeah. In terms of social media. And I also don't well, know that social malicious. media is gossip because there isn't somebody talking back to you. Not yeah. really. But I think that it captures that archetypal dynamic, which is why mm-hmm. it's compelling. But, mm-hmm. yeah. I think there's a, I, I would agree. So I want to like think about intention and consequence, right? So I think that there is a malicious consequence to gossip. Can be both, like regular gossip Can and, be. yeah. And... And I want to bring the ego back in. So what happens when somebody is gossiping about their neighbor's new car is they're possibly defending themselves from their own envy for that new Mm -hmm. car, right? Wanting to denigrate the Mm -hmm. other because they don't have a new car trying to get people on. So it's not malicious consciously. It's a little bit unconsciously again in that, uh, especially the Kleinian idea. Again, if you envy something, you want Mm -hmm. to attack it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but thinking about on the as you're talking maybe on the broader scale, Twitter, you know, all of the torturing I've been doing to myself about whether I should tweet or what I should tweet or how I should tweet over the past month doesn't matter a lick, right? Like when you think, okay, so we're gossiping about a war going on in the Middle East, you know, I'm not going to change anybody's mind um, in Palestine or Israel, mm-hmm. and and that's when I really kind of had this awakening, thinking, wow, I'm spending so much time thinking about this for a contribution that may land as heavily as talking to my neighbor about whether this person is right for having this car. You know, like what is, what, what is the end game of working ourselves up when we're just having an opinion on something we have no control over? It's egoic again, right? It's, I am telling you about myself because of how I'm Mm -hmm. angry about Mm -hmm. this, right? That would be the ego, the unconscious ego motivation. But, but I'm glad you You took it there. Because I, I wanted to, I've been thinking about that too. And, you know, for example, you're saying you felt like you had to post something. And I think, you know, universities have been going through this, right? The universities feel like they have to make a statement and they're in this pickle because, you know, what if you make the wrong statement? So, um, and I think about, you know, why do we need to put up a Ukrainian flag or any flag? Or why do we need to... Um, change our social media profile to show what we stand for when, as you're saying, it's not going to have any impact. Mm-hmm. And and to go back, I think a little bit to what you were saying before, Deb, about, about the wound is, does speaking out in outrage and posting something on social media, does it help us defend against feelings of helplessness? Because when I read about what's going on in the Middle East, for example, or Ukraine, I am actually so overcome with horror and grief and and helplessness. You know that there's mm-hmm. such extreme yeah. suffering. It's hard to let it in. You know, a, a photograph of a mother cradling a dead child. I it's mean, impossible I, to let it in. How do I look at that and then go on with my mm-hmm. day? And it may yeah. be that posting, you know, something, uh, making a strong statement on social media kind of makes me feel like I'm doing something, but it, mm-hmm. but it's, it's ultimately it's um, I, I'm trying to metabolize these, these feelings that really can't be metabolized of kind of horror at, at the suffering. Mm-hmm. I want to jump in here for a sec and, and uh, kind of take a step or two back. There's a whole theory in evolutionary psychology that, humans really evolve language in order to gossip. The, we need to know what our neighbor's doing and, you know, why does she do this and what's the matter with him and so on. A- as a way of reinforcing so social norms through, as you said, Aaron, through personal knowledge so that we have a cohesive society, mm-hmm. that there is the desire for unification, cooperation, et cetera, which, of course, um, helped us evolve, and its opposite is competition and all the rest of it. But what I'm wondering is whether there's a substrate here to the gossip function of social media where th- there is some intent to get to a-, a common thread, but that we really cannot translate something that was meant for small groups with personal knowledge into something global, massive, 
where there is absolutely no personal connection and can't be a personal connection, but that the substrate is a desire for a common thread, a desire for uh, some kind of a place of sameness and and unity. And it's a false effort uh, in terms of social media and what social media can do the underlying urge is uh, perhaps healthier, mm. or, you know, more connected. I, I think that's totally right. And when you, when you look at, and this isn't particularly my area, but when, when you look at where there have been successes around dialogue, you know, they're almost mm-hmm. always very small groups of people, whether it's interracial yes. groups around sexual orientation or gender or around uh, transgenerational trauma, right? You're talking about a group of maybe 12 people working very hard over a long period of time to hear mm-hmm. each mm-hmm. other and to be impacted by each other. And A, I think you're totally right. It's, it, it's inappropriate and, and won't happen on social media. But B, Social media is private enterprise, right? So it's not the the intent isn't that anyway. Right. The intent is engagement. Right. So you sell more donuts than you do salads. They're not interested in selling, <laughs> right? Salads, um, which is why I mean I I'm just like I'm so sad about Elon Musk because I think he he bought this platform that had such potential that he's just mm-hmm. throwing into the wind, right? So I don't think you can do the small scale stuff on Twitter, but I think you probably can do something. I mean, there's some really smart people. If your intention was to, you know, was to create dialogue, you could create algorithms or ways in which a platform engaged that would at least Mm. lean into that more than it does. Mm. So capitalism has something to answer for, right? And just, Mm. just because it's a, it's, it's, it's a business, right? I, I think you can have a business and you can, you know, it can be humane as well. But, you know, way back, I mean, my book's 10 years old now, but when I was looking into Facebook 10 years ago, um, it was interesting because what they called maintained relationships. So you could have 500 friends on Facebook, but maintained relationships were generally under 130 people. So right inside Mm. Dunbar's area. So those were people that you regularly sent messages to, talked to, kept up with, and then you'd be all these extraneous people. You know, you can imagine a situation where you build small hubs, you know, and I, it's funny because I always used Israel and Palestine as an example when I was talking about my book in the early days. Like, what if on Facebook you lived in Israel mm-hmm. and you had to have a certain percentage of your friends come, you know, that are Palestinian and vice versa? That that was part of the algorithm, right? Or that if you're a U.S. Republican, you had to have so many Democrats in your in your feed. Wow. Now, I'm not saying that would <laughs> that would fix it because the medium is still mm-hmm. problematic. But if you could create a way that enhanced curiosity and dialogue maybe it was an opt-in something right you there are i think there are peripheral ways in which Mm, you can bring elements of that desire in love to see someone develop that yeah me too really interesting and i wish people in our jobs i wish depth therapists were more at the table in the development of different kinds of technology because i think we have a lot to offer in relation to what intersubjectivity means and what the difference between recognition and validation is and how we might be able to inform mm. how that works. Yeah. You know, okay, and so we this do is that a call out to time. all developers listening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> call us. <laughs> we do that all the time in the consulting room. Of it's not just what you know, you, whoever our client might be, are doing, but why you're doing it and how you're doing it. Uh, what's the process underneath of uh, the, the old uh, trope of, you know, what it's about is not what it's about. Yes. And that's what's, that's kind of what needs to happen now on the social yes. media side of the, well, actually on both sides, right? So on the kind of geopolitical side. We know the content narrative of what it's about, but people will have very different opinions of where they put their um, um, emphasis, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But under that, what do people need, right? Because then there's got to be tomorrow, so you can spend the rest of the time totting up um, blame and responsibility and accountability. But where are you going to live tomorrow? 
And how are you going to write that? That's the, you know, most people really do want to be able to wake up in the morning, have a job to go to, have food and water and, you know, all of Maslow's stuff, right? Not be in danger. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of generational, you know, <laughs> uh, baggage and accountability, you know, you look at Germany is actually a really good an, uh, example, you know, the work that Germany did after the Second World War mm -hmm. to integrate its atrocities into its education system and come to terms with it. Um, it's really remarkable. And it's done it in a way that lots of lots of other countries haven't managed to integrate their colonial histories or their history of old or continuing atrocities into a kind of reasonable, pragmatic, thoughtful process to move forward. Yeah, with. Germany sort of achieved the depressive position. Mm. I think so. As one as well as well as one can, I guess, right? Yeah. Not that there still aren't pockets of um, neo Nazis exactly. in Germany. I don't want to, want to lie over that, but uh, substantially, yeah, the discourse is. Yeah. Um, I, I want to maybe bring up another concept that I think is related to all of this, which is this idea of co rumination. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, my understanding from the research is that, you know, in general, when we talk to each other about our problems, we tend to feel better. But um, there's one form of talking to each other about our problems that makes us feel worse. And uh, the research around, around this really noted the propensity of adolescent females to do this with one another. So they get together and they um, talk about their problems and they, 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 they commiserate with each other to an extent where they just kind of spin each other up. But I mean, I think mm -hmm. all of us can relate to this. And I think this maybe is happening on social media. I'd be curious if you would agree with that. But one of you said before, Joseph, I think it was you, that we, when you, you go to your analyst and you're complaining about something, you don't want your analyst to, you know, start, you know, yelling at you with you. Oh, like, oh, that's terrible. You know, what, what you want Let's is go. that. <laughs> right. You want the creation of this space where your feelings can be heard, recognized, held. Uh, you don't want to be told, well, that's not a problem. You know, we'll fix that right away. Right. You don't want to go right to, to a fix it mentality. You want, you want spaciousness. You want space to have that reaction, but you don't want someone to join in with you because, uh, you know, that's like throwing gasoline on the fire and it can, it can, it can feel good initially. It can feel really good, but it just deepens the experience. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help you achieve a kind of broader perspective on it. So I think that's that. That's that we can really see that in social media. And sometimes you go there because you want someone to kind of commiserate with you about whatever the thing is. But if you just stay in that loop, um, you don't achieve any kind of transcendent position on the problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been thinking, you know, like lately Twitter is kind of like, it's all look how bad, right? So look how bad, yeah. look how bad, and look how bad, right? Yes. Yeah, it's really bad. Look how bad. And and that is a, <laughs> yeah. a co-ruminative, right? Um, as you said, putting gasoline on the fire situation. And I, I'm thinking about, mm. you know, I think, and, and you, may, you may not agree so much clinically, but when you identify... Um, it's one of the few areas where I think interrupting, say, is an important thing. So when you identify a neurotic response to something that you're familiar with mm. with someone, you know, what you don't do is just give them space to pile on themselves with it, right? So let's pause sure. for a second. Let's stop for a second. Yeah. You're winding yourself yep. up, right? Like, yep. particularly when you know them pretty mm -hmm. well and you, you can spot it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not correcting it, but you are kind of saying that this is, un, you know, this is not a productive use of emotional energy. And I think, yeah, I think the opposite is what's happening online is that there is whenever anybody tries to regulate they are shut down it was funny in my experience that i was writing about you know i said this word i, I said in one tweet 
you know, we, we shouldn't condemn people for understanding. Understanding is not justification. And someone said, you know, you're justifying. And then someone else, and then I said, well, look at the tweet. I, I literally said, understanding and understanding is not justifying. And how can you rationalize terrorism? And there was a willingness to read it, not as I had put it, right? So that's a, actually an attachment to the amplified, like, I want to be angry with you, right? I don't want to hear you saying, pause, regulate, down. I'm angry. I want to be angry. And now I'm going to show you loads of evidence why I should be angry. So I was getting loads of videos about how bad Hamas is. And I'm like, I'm not, mm. you don't need to show me. I know how bad uh, Hamas is, <laughs> right? Mm. But can we stop saying how bad it is and, and go, and obviously not in that case, and obviously not on Twitter, and obviously not when you're in a state of trauma. Mm. I mean, there's a whole lot of obviously not, you know, I'm not, I'm not asking war combatants to stop and empathize with each other. I wish they would stop, right? But like, just have to like, yeah. stop stop the damage first but you do have to stop the self-perpetuating intensity of emotional mm -hmm. contagion that is very problematic yeah mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that we don't do a good job uh, in the public sphere or social media sphere of separating feeling from thinking and that happens uh, between individuals all the time too of that the recognition is you're upset, you feel bad, it's disturbing, uh, and then it gets conflated with thinking. And if you are disturbed and upset and angry, then you must be right, that that's correct, that, you know, the X, Y, Z factor is right. bad and wrong, versus I hear that you're upset and angry and distressed. Yes. And... Now let's see, once the feelings have been recognized, let's see if we can understand this. Take a step back. Uh, let's see how we can actually relate to it. But it's very easy for people to conflate uh, recognition and validation. Very, very easy. We slip into it all the time. Yeah, I mean, that's the fallacy of emotional reasoning, right? If you feel mm -hmm. it, it must be true. Yep. I'm thinking about what I always find very helpful is Jung's conception of kind of being par uh, being paralyzed. I was going to say possessed by a complex, right? Yes. So you know, and I think that's what happens. You're identified with this complex. Mm -hmm. You're possessed by it, and you need to be outside of it to do what you're asking mm -hmm. people to do, Deb, or what I'm asking people to do. Yeah. And what's happening is we, we have a promotion of identification with complex. So everybody's got their own complex. They're fully identified with it. Then they're going online, possessed by the complex. And I guess you could go archetypal on it because of where this particular conflict comes from. Then we go archetypal. So you're possessed. So you, you culture complex, archetypal complex, and possessions are very dangerous I think this is, mm -hmm. and I hope to be more hopeful than I am in this moment, but I think when you have identification with a complex on a global scale is when you really have major world moments, right? I think that that's what the First and Second World War was about. Mm -hmm. That's what slavery was about. That was colonialism was about, right? This kind of mass identification with a complex. So you don't even see the complex because you're it. Mm-hmm. In the capacity to have an observing ego, <clears throat> experiencing a complex is a whole different thing. But you have to let go of that identification, and people are very reluctant to do that. Because mm. then you're back in depressive to kind of mix models, right? Well, and the models do mix. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah, that, that's the same thing. Look at psychoanalysis, right? It's just like identified with the person, the school, you can't see the reson you know, the, the perfect resonances on the other side because you're so identified with whether it's Jung or Klein or Freud or whatever process. It's like, we're all kind of talking about the same thing. We're just using different language and have different affinities. You know, let's, let's get over it. I say to this Jungian. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, to we're totally done really with well. that. We're totally done with it. To use your yeah, word. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> We're theoretically <laughs> promiscuous. Yes. <laughs> um, but good, but good speaking position. of Jung, and I appreciated you bringing in the idea of complexes, I want to 
I want to go back to this idea that's come up, but we haven't really addressed it head on, which is projection. And of course, that's not just a Jungian idea at all. It was very important to climb, but it was also something that Jung talked a lot about. Uh, you know, I think we, we kind of know what that means. It's an unconscious process where we see what is actually inside us. We see it kind of pasted it on to someone or something in the environment. And it's totally natural. It's normal. It has a you know, an important function psychologically, well, several different uh, functions psychologically, but it's also, it can be dangerous. And uh, specifically um, in Jungian thought, we talk about projecting out shadow contents. And I think that's a lot of what's going on when mm -hmm. we're reactive. I think we can think about shadow projection and social media a lot so that we take those parts of ourselves that we don't like unconsciously we disidentify with them we say that's not me that's them and there was a very important book written by uh eric neumann who was uh, an analyst and uh kind of a follower of jung and, and a colleague of jung they they um, knew each other and uh, in in the immediate aftermath of world war ii Neumann wrote this book called to Depth Psychology and a New Ethic. And, and essentially what he said is we are living in a world where we can no longer manage shadow by projecting it. If we continue to do this, we will destroy ourselves. And Jung has this great quote that I wish I could lay my hands on. Maybe I'll be able to find it in a minute. He said the most important work that we can do politically is to reclaim our shadow projections. So I think, you know, Aaron, to use your, your great concept of kind of reactivity, which is basically like being in a complex, we're really in this state where we're probably projecting shadow, and it, it can mm -hmm. be helpful to remember that, slow down and say, wait, what am I seeing out there, and where might that be in me? Where, where can I There's find that, that in myself? Young. That's, I'll have to paraphrase it, of course, but you know that thing about you know that that which you don't integrate from your shadow becomes it feels like fate when it, when it yes. happens, right? And I think that's what you're seeing, not on the personal scale, but on the kind of population level, right? And when you see the content of the discourse on Twitter or coming out of those places, it feels like a fatedness. Right? Well, it it is it is a fatedness because those wounds haven't been worked through. Mm -hmm. I think that is a really brilliant conception of his, the way in which the personal shadow, if unintegrated and unacknowledged, will come out as if it happens outside of you. Mm -hmm. So he said, yeah. projections change the world into the replica of one's own unknown face. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the quote you were thinking of. That's another great quote, but um, yeah. Let's, let's talk about that. When I'm thinking bit, of it's very popular on Instagram. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> sorry, Jess. Because I think reclaiming shadow is actually very nuanced and very complicated. So, for instance, if, we, if we're looking at the newsreel about the war going on between Ukraine and Russia, and as many Americans have, um, feeling identified with Ukraine as as being victimized. There can be an enormous, intense feelings, uh, aggressions, projections. But where I think it becomes difficult when we talk about this is that the projection of shadow is not an absolute correlate. It's often very nuanced. So, for instance, if, if someone is uh, outraged, um, at Russia, does it literally mean that I unconsciously want to attack my neighbor and annihilate them? Because some people will look at shadow that concretely, and then they'll say, well, I don't have any neighbors that I want to hurt, and then they'll dismiss it. So I wonder if we could talk about how to make use of that idea um, in terms of reclaiming shadow in that subtle self-inquiry. I'm wondering with what do you guys think about ways that people might do that? What do you think, Aaron? I think we're talking about 
wound again mm. and the will to heal. And I think when you're in, so I think that Ukraine is an example. So what, what could be projected onto that is like, like you say, it's a super nuanced and individual, you know, it could be an abusive father, for example, it's still kind of a, a, a Mm -hmm. basic you know um reduction right but it could it could be something like that again it could be um uh a value of injustice it could be an identification with the underdog a whole combination of those sorts of things right so i think in an ideal situation let's say the person has integrated their nuanced shadow as well as one could right the response to the external situation it's like a, the the pain and the effrontery and the in the anger is still present but you're not drawing it into your own you're not using it for yourself to process your your baggage right so you would engage i guess i'm kind of talking in the in almost in the words of how they talk about enlightened people right that enlightened people and the kind of you know um, Eastern sense, right? They don't stop experiencing attachments or love or pain or anger or any of that, but they're egoless about it. So it's just kind of, they're passing phenomena and then you make choices in relation to the passing phenomena. And I think it's a very similar mm. situation. You don't, you don't stop being activated. You just don't use what's activating you as a way to process or not process. It's actually not processing, right? It's reconfirming your wound, right? Or re reconfirming your pathological dynamic of la lack of control or... And it's a very interesting question because I think this, this has a lot to do with activism, right? So in how people become activists. So a lot of people are activists in one way or, the, you know, in the, in the more enlightened way, in a sense, or the very more, more personal way. It's a personal vendetta that gets sublimated through activism, which isn't necessarily helpful for that person. It might be an outcome that pushes things along but you know people get burnt out because mm -hmm. they're identified with something personal that they're playing out through the activism yep. which can look very similar to someone who isn't identified with it and doing the same mm -hmm. thing so i think that's where you have a very subtle like behaviorally it might look exactly the same but they're just not being mm -hmm. burnt out because they're a little bit less identified with something personal mm. So in a way, maybe your question, Joseph, goes to how do we identify and disentangle our personal history and our personal shadow from you know an issue, an, a, an outer world issue. Yes. Um, and that, that I've done that part, but it doesn't mean that we can never take a stand. You know, that then, okay, then everything is, you know, something to be understood and related to. No, uh, we mm -hmm. we do take a stand, which goes to Jung's ethical stance, um, and that ultimately it is our responsibility to make ethical decisions, and that there are there are, you know no really easy answers. Uh, of takes us right back to where we started. As, is my ethical stance reactive? of that I want that double cheese, whatever it was, <laughs> burger, <laughs> you know, and, and, that, and I'm calling it an ethical decision, but it's reactive. Or is it actually an ethical decision that just today for these various other reasons and opportunity and so on, I'm really uh, deciding. Uh, it calls for a lot of discrimination inside mm -hmm. oneself Mm -hmm. uh, that's hard to achieve. Yes, and, and of course, having a, an ethical stance is a, a thoughtful process, which is, I think, different from what Lisa was bringing you forward in terms of shadow, which is mm -hmm. shadow projection is a very unconscious process, and so it requires an almost forensic attitude <laughs> to be able to pick up a thread of what is, where is this going in one way or another, so just in terms of our listeners, I'd like to offer just a few forensic clues around <laughs> this. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find really interesting, one is for people to really name the feelings that they're having about the outer event. 
So like you said, is it grief? Is it fear? Is it anger? What kind of anger? Is it defensive anger? Is it aggressive anger? What are the fantasies around it? And I'm often very interested in phrases that they will often repeat when they're talking about something that's activating them. For instance, a client who talks about uh, the Ukraine-Russian conflict, and they keep saying, they're monsters. They're just monsters. And then that happens numerous times in our conversations. So one of the things I might ask them to do is, let's just take that phrase, they're monsters, and just move it out of that context. And let's just keep talking about mm. that phrase, they're monsters. And tell me, where else have you heard that? Or where else have you said that? Or where else has that been important? And, and sometimes that very subtle indirect way can give us a sense of some unfinished wound, as you were saying, Aaron. But there's something going on inside of us that we're um, projecting onto the situation as a way of making it more obvious to ourselves, as a way of kind of ringing an internal alarm. That doesn't in any way, Deb, suggest that the outer situation doesn't involve a moral intervention uh, because there's enormous unnecessary suffering that's being inflicted for re awful reasons. But to your point, Lisa, is if our response feels disproportionate to our personal and actual um, danger in the situation, then we could rightfully become interested in how much of my own material has invaded the narrative mm -hmm. or invaded the images. So, so I am curious, Lisa, when you feel that shadow projection is just substantially involved, I mean, how do you lead somebody out of the fant collective fantasy and into that interiority? Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think there's sort of how I, I try to do it for myself, and then there's how I might try to do it for someone that I'm sitting with. And I, I think you're, you're, you've really, you're really touching into it, Joseph. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's sort of focusing on the feeling, first of all, and, and often it's the vulnerable feeling. So it's, it's, yeah, you know, there's a lot of anger there, but, you know, what, what else is there? Um, and, and, uh, and trying to forensically maybe uh, research where that original wound might be for that person. You know, was it was it back in childhood? Where where was the earliest version of this wound that might be? You know, we're hearing echoes of it now. Um, I, I was going to add, and I, I really like everything you said. Um, you know, I was talking with our, our friend and colleague, um, Putty Leroux, at some point recently, and she used this phrase that I really like. She said, you know, you, you have a question and then you hold it, you hold it as an internal question. So if you feel like your, your, your response is disproportionate, not to the situation, I mean, it's hard to imagine an emotional response that's disproportionate to the situation that, you know, such as Ukraine or the Middle East. But to my own uh, actual uh, sort of in the moment experience, you know, so if I, I'm feeling just overwhelmingly devastated and I'm here safe in my home in Philadelphia, that might want to give me pause, that I could ask myself, what's going on with me? And I could hold that as an internal question. And I think the reason I, I like Putty's phrase is because it, it kind of, uh, carries with with it the sense that I'm going to keep on thinking about it, that I'm going to let it mm -hmm. rest there, that I'm not going to have an immediate answer, but that in in other words, it it really conveys this attitude of curiosity. And so, in, you know, in some sense, curiosity is the antidote to projection. That I could get curious about myself, I could get curious about my emotional response. And uh, that that somehow might uh, help me find a way through it. If I can sustain it, I have to sustain the mm -hmm. curiosity and not, not ask myself the question and then immediately think I have the answer. I have to live with the question. So the curiosity is about perhaps finding 
kind of internal facts or psychic facts inside of ourselves. And the curiosity can also be extended to find external facts. You know, one of my friends who is um, Jewish is, of course, incredibly distraught about what's happening. But one of the ways that she is pr proceeding is um, going into a very assertive study of the geopolitics of the Levant mm -hmm. to, to just have a much larger um, mental context of how, do, how does one understand this kind of um, devastating events, not to explain it away, but mm -hmm. just as you were saying, Aaron, to have larger and larger frames of mm -hmm. understanding so that at least the mind can contain the images, ideas that we're hearing, that we have to grow in any number of our functions to be large enough to tolerate um, a, a concept mm -hmm. and to develop a concept that's large enough to at least lean into the amount of data that we're receiving. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a wonderful beginning mm -hmm. um, in terms of relating to the images mm -hmm. there. So outer facts, inner facts, and yeah. not being satisfied with being just reactive. Yeah, I think that uh, there are lots of ways to be curious, and that that in itself is a wonderful touchstone of, am I curious? Can I get mm -hmm. interested? Um, w whether it's introspective curiosity or, you know, study and learning uh, in the external world, of curiosity um, is, a, is a way to really mark where am I with this. And it's a dangerous sign when curiosity is demonized, which I think goes mm -hmm. to what you were saying, Aaron, how dare you understand, or how dare you communicate your interest in understanding more mm -hmm. and more and more about what's mm -hmm. happening. So this threat that you better shut that down, or I'll be gunning for you, I'll be coming <laughs> after you, <laughs> or it's just so wildly so. Pr provocative to suggest that we penetrate oh. the mysteries around us. Or that we might understand something about ourselves that we're not ready to, which I feel like that's the fear of the curiosity, right? I might discover that this narrative I've had about what's right in this situation isn't what I thought it was. And then your identity is challenged, right? So it's like, okay, so if I am what I thought, and I think that the, the situation in the Middle East is a really, a really good one for that. I thought I was this person because I had these beliefs and this was my narrative. I start to get curious. I mean, I spreading curiosity about what's going on or what's what's happening as your your friend had it's like okay well i might find that i'm th that my identity is challenged by what i'm being curious about and then i find out that mm -hmm. i'm i might be kind of a different person i mean this is speaking to individuation now isn't it that like my in yep. inferior parts whether that's well i don't want to i don't want to kind of confuse that in there because i think it's more about narrative and self story right I might have to give up my story about myself if I mm. understand something that challenges that story in a way, which is a loss that then would need to be grieved and which is challenging to the people around you, which is, I think, what's happening with a lot of people, whether Jewish or Palestinian um, or have leanings either way, who kind of mm -hmm. says, well, this is where I'm coming from, but I can see the other side, that the people who are more yeah. attached to the identity proposition says, but you must not see the other side, because then that challenges my story about what yes. the other side is. Which takes us right back to Klein. That's the depressive position. Yes. Uh, of if I lose my story about mm -hmm. one side good and one side bad, uh, that's that paranoid schizoid position. And the depressive position is, oh, God, I might have to modify my story. I might lose mm -hmm. part of my story in understanding, um, to go back to Klein, that, that mom ha has uh, her upside and her downside. Mm -hmm. Things are complicated. And then the consequences of that in the real world, right? Because suddenly you have different ideas, maybe, about the, from the people, the close people around you. And then, you know, what do you, 
how do you live that difference when there is a the gossip, not so much gossip, right? But that kind of regulating local yes. regulating environment that says, well, this is how we think, right? Maybe mm. not so much, and then you're really you're you're, you're introducing a, a friction in a I use it widely like in a familial group, right? Mm. You had mentioned something, Aaron, um, briefly, and, and Lisa, you were leaning into it in terms of this co-rumination process, which has to do with identity formation. And I know that you have uh, explored and written about the impact um, on identity formation with all of these social media um, channels. So I'm wondering if you can um, introduce us to a sense of that impact, perhaps how we experienced identity formation before social media became so central, how social media has changed identity formation, what's the cost, possibly even what are some of the benefits, just being fair-minded about it. So what are your thoughts? On the positive side, I think what social media has enabled is for people with less conventional identity formations. So whether that's around gender or sexual orientation or race or neurodiversity or whatever, you can, you can easily mm -hmm. find people that share that with you in a way that previously you were unable to do, right? So, you know, I'm a gay man. I grew up in the suburbs of Wilmington, Delaware in the late 70s and early 80s, and I didn't have any positive representations of gayness around. I couldn't reach out to other people on online, right? So that was a really, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to Dr. Ruth, actually, who normalized that and came through on her radio mm -hmm. show and was like, she was just wonderful. Ruth right? Westheimer. So there was Yes, she was amazing. And there was this voice, th this adult voice that was like, you're okay, you know, in the early 80s. Yeah, and that was yeah. very, very helpful for me. Not social media. And I, I, so I think there's that opportunity on there. But then like everything, there's the shadow side, right? So what happens is you find an identity that resonates with you. You club up with a bunch of people that who to whom it resonates. But because it's gesticular, right? Because it's a gesture, it's not a very deep, um, deep and meaningful and complex. You know, everybody has their own deep and meaningful and complex relationship with that identity, but the way it's shared is based, you know, the word for it, but you know, it, it could be a, a, a diagnostic category in the DSM, you know, it could be a, mm -hmm. a, a pronoun, whatever, whatever it is, where the differences between the people who share that identity then get missed. And then what we know mm -hmm. from the quantitative data is that, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it is in that paper. We might link to that, that, um, the people who are sharing information on things like Twitter, it's, it, it's something like, you know, check it later, but it's something like more than 75% of the material shared is shared by sort of like less than 10% of the people that are tweeting. Yeah. Right. So th that set of people who are the 10% or whatever, these numbers are up for grabs. They're, they're out there somewhere we can find them, right? But that subset of people who are actually saying something tend to be more polarized because what they're saying is... A short thing. They're not saying, you know, a bit of this and a bit of that because it doesn't really track on social media. So what you end up having is 80% of the voices who aren't identifying with the polarity of identity category. This is what everybody's like who experiences this. And I use the example, there's a meme that goes around of a, of a guy on a lift <clears throat> with a look of relief on his face saying, um, what introverts feel when people don't step onto the lift with them? An elevator, yeah. And I'm like, nobody wants people to step into an elevator. Like, you know, th that's not under the domain of introverts only. In any way, an introvert is not a kind of a person. You know, you, you guys know this more yeah, than yeah. anyone. You know, it's a, we have our inferior and superior. So suddenly we have this identity category of introvert who's different mm -hmm. from everybody else because we don't like yep. people in our elevator, which nobody likes, right? So that, I find that example works really well because it it takes an identity category, it reduces it, ad absurdum and completely it, it, and then and then divides you from other people right so i'm nothing like all you other people because i'm an introvert who has who shares a, a theme that most people share it's completely mm -hmm. madness right 
the reductive nature of identities as expressed on social mm. media lack nuance and complexity and depth. It feels scary or impossible to go out there and say, I experience it like this, but I also like it like this, which is not what other introverts would say to use as an example. So on the one hand, it's like, oh, well, what they're saying about introversion really appeals to me. So I must have some introversion in me. But then that becomes, so I'm an introvert and now I'm like surrounded by everybody else who identifies as introvert. And now I'm so different from everybody else that I can't really relate to them and they don't really understand me, <laughs> which is the polarizing effect, which I think is really dangerous. Hmm. I'm just really length. appreciating. Sorry. <laughs> I'm really appreciating that. Uh, um, the the two sides of identity formation, you know, uh, for Jung, you know, the ego differentiates from the unconscious. We're so unconscious, and then heroically we fight our way to a self definition. But also, self defining also means I am not you. Yeah, uh, I am over here, and you're over there. And then, as you said, uh, if we ever make it to enlightenment, those barriers are then dissolved again. So it's this necessary cycle of separation in order to then come back together with some sense of consciousness. Yes. I love but, the idea. I mean, I use this a lot to be provocative, but I, I call it the, the myth of heteronormativity. So you get a lot of people getting incensed about the heteronormativity, right? And I'm like, I've never met a heteronormative person in my entire life. Like you talk to someone as a, as a therapist or as a friend, you know, people have ideas, fantasies, desires that are like, no, nobody just wants to go home to their, yeah. you know, monogamous partner and have vanilla sex with them and doesn't have any fantasies or anything, right? So people get really incensed with what is, the, heteronormativity is a, is a conceptual thing and a cultural thing is real and there are consequences to the conception of heteronormativity, right? But no individual person is heteronormative in the sense that there isn't an archetypal autistic person's experience that everybody shares or an ADHD experience or a gay experience or, you know, that's what's so great, you know, our, our individualized experience. Mm -hmm. And then we get in arguments with concepts and then we feel like, well, now I've identified as this. I should be like this. It's a bit limiting, right? And mm -hmm. and the thing is that the the incredible complexity and absolutely unknowable, ultimately unknowable nature of each one of us in our, you know, unbelievable individuality, that's universal. Like we're yes. all that complex and unknowable <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing you can count on. Is that we're all the like depths that. Are, are yes are universal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so much of identity formation, I think, has to do with finding accurate descriptive language, and whether or not that's taken from the culture or whether it rises up inside of us. If we can't describe ourselves to ourselves, and we're we're overly mysterious, and then we're also very vulnerable to this kind of um, over identification with a meme <laughs> at mm -hmm. the worst yes. or, or any or a religious sect or something like that so this is partially the ambivalence that people have about jung's typology system that um it really does exist as a way of trying to give people descriptive language and also more importantly which i think many people that have dismissed that by identifying some major markers in one's typology, there is a suggestion of what is undeveloped that one could become curious about even before it, um, it sends up a little flare later on in life. So if one is, identifies with being an introvert, one can decisively become interested in what does extroversion mean and what might it be to develop this other side of my personality. But as you're saying, if people over-identify with it, it begins to feel like a straitjacket. Yeah, I and mean, what an adventure, it. right? So this you talk alleged again, right? So I didn't have a word for this, and now I know that it's introversion. Again, the same example, right? So, so I can surround myself with that, or I could get excited about extroversion. I might not be as good at it as introversion, and I prefer it like this than that. But it also enables us to understand the extroverts, right? So when we really kind of stick our noses in that one category, because we share more than we don't share, and I think it's the same case in the global thing that we're talking about now, when we get stuck in the, the different 
the, the narrative of difference. And I'm not dismissing the importance of those categories and the capacity sure. to label them and put language on them. My whole thing, I just always say, okay, hold it lightly or hold it heavily at first and then hold mm-hmm. it lightly. Yeah. So like I'm right. going all in, I found out I'm this thing. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. great. Do what you need to do with it. And then maybe you can hold it a little bit more lightly. So mm-hmm. it doesn't define every kind of possibility. For you. Mm-hmm. And that and goes to that first, of, individuation. Right, first half versus second half of life. Yeah, yeah. You know, yes, tightening yeah, the grip good. and then loosening mm-hmm. the grip. Uh, St. Francis has this beautiful phrase that I always think about that. He says, where the world is a loose garment. Oh, so, that's you know, there's, you, you could wear, wear these different concepts as a loose garment and not, and not become sort of overly identified with them. You know, I want to just take a minute, um, maybe just zooming out a little bit to talk about at least what I, what I think about this, um, kind of why this discussion matters, because I think it really does matter, this discussion we've been having. Um, but, you know, Jung said, I was looking, he said this a bunch of different ways, and I didn't find the perfect quote, but I found one that sort of works. He says, we're on our guard against contagious diseases of the body, but we are exasperatingly careless when it comes to the even more dangerous collective diseases of the mind. And what he was talking about there is he he said a couple of times, you know, don't forget about earthquakes, forget about, you know, pandemics or, you know, the real danger to humanity is us and and <laughs> and these, you know, these mm-hmm. sort of contagious diseases of the mind, as he calls them. And and I do think that if you if you look at history, even just say 20th century history these uh, emotional contagions have the potential to do very, very great harm. And that, you know, that not only leans into kind of huge geopolitical things that are frighteningly on the horizon, but even just, you know, some of the footage that I've seen on Twitter of say, what's going on in college campuses, you know, with, with people really uh, hurting each other or really threatening to hurt each other, um, you know, over, you know, what's going on in the global situation. And it, and it's like, this really matters what we're talking about. I mean, this ability to step back from reactivity and, and get curious about our process or, you know, reach the depressive physician or withdraw our projections or whatever language mm-hmm. you want to use for it. I mean, it, it has the potential to really make a difference in the world if more of us can do that. Aaron, you've um, also written about um, distress management, I believe, and stress management and emotional regulation. So just reaching down into that in just very pragmatic terms, because I think that would help people. So there's a listener who's doom scrolling about anything under the sun, whether it's politics or geopolitics or, I don't know, pollution. Um, they're in a state of distress. So could you speak a little bit about how, how could someone imagine what's going on inside of them when they, when they begin to feel that mounting reactive distress? And what are some practical things that somebody might do to get some breathing room around? Okay. What, what I like <laughs> to say is, let let your freak out be your your ticket out. <laughs> like if you're freaking out in your way, so or spinning out, whatever you wanna, you know, whatever you get, if you're freaking out in the way that you freak out, mm-hmm. that's what you become aware of. Because mm-hmm. that means that somebody has touched your button for whatever reason. And it's the greatest gift in the world. I'm talking more about sort of maybe emotion rather than doom scrolling. We can get on to that in a second. But if somebody you've sure. had a conversation or argument with someone or you've seen something that triggers you and you're, you notice that you're having the conversation in your head or you're in a state of high anxiety or like you feel like you need to react to quell it. That acknowledgement that you're freaking out is all you need to do. Right. Well, it's not all you need to do. It's the main thing that you need to do. The forensic analysis can come later. Right. The first thing that. It's like, okay, for whatever it is, and I don't know, I'm freaking out in the way that I freak out. And I know that better than anything else because I hate it when I'm freaking out. And then it's just like, I'm freaking out. So I'm going to leave it. Like, I'm just going to, I'm, 
I, I'm going to acknowledge that I'm freaking out. I'm not going to try and solve it. I'm not going to engage in the conversation that's going on in my head to solve it, because then you're engaging in the same register as the freak out, right? Which is why CBT often fails with this kind of stuff, because then you just get a better language for standing on the mm. other side of the irrational thinking or whatever it is. And I do think there's a place for CBT, but not in this space, right? And then you get to know, like, well, if later, it's like, well, of course I was freaking out, because I always freak out when something like so-and-so happens. And that's when you can really own it. And that's when you basically you're saying, I have a complex, right? I have a complex <laughs> mm -hmm. about criticism or I have a complex about getting it wrong or injustice, right? So I was inside my complex. I'm not going to do anything until I come outside my complex. And the way I know <clears throat> I was in my complex is because I was freaking out. Right? <laughs> so that for me, that's always because I know exactly what my freak out feels like, you know, and I'll have one when this podcast is over and I'll think about something I said that didn't come out right or, you know, <laughs> feels like, well, you know, and then I'll freak out about it and I'll be like, hey, you're freaking out. And then you can, you can make that decision. But then what happens, I find is, yeah, you can go to therapy and do the forensics around it. You get more and more familiar with that. So that takes the heat off of it. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, okay, I freak out in these circumstances. And then when you mm -hmm. recognize that, you tend to freak out less, you tend to freak out less intensively. And you tend to freak out for as much time as before. Yeah, that's exactly right. The higher the triggering faster. event. Yes, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the triggering events will always kind of, you know, some so, the, the triggering event will happen where you'd be like, oh, but this time it's serious. Like, I'm not just, I'm not in my complex. I'm really, you know, yes. and you have to listen out for that because it's mm -hmm. like an immune system, right? It, it doubles down. But if it feels like that 98% of the time you're in your complex and you probably don't have to worry as much as you are about it, you know, mm -hmm. there is that 2% of the time which is what keeps us on our toes. Hey everybody, this is Joseph, and I'm just taking a moment to step outside of the frame and to ask a few things of you. If you are watching us on YouTube, please press the subscribe button. It'll just take one second, and it is so helpful to us. If you're listening on Apple Podcast, like us, and perhaps leave a review with a couple of stars. Very helpful. There's a few other resources that we always like to remind you about. One is our dream school. We've worked very hard to create a way for people to advance their own understanding of dreams, their ability to harvest what they can from that wisdom and then apply it. So you can go to our website, thisjunginlife.com, just click on dream school, check it out. We'd love to have you with us. And one more bit, please take a look at our Patreon page. This is an opportunity for you to help us keep the lights on and keep corporate sponsorship away from us. So thank you so much. And back to the episode. So with doom scrolling, it's, it's actually kind of a similar solution, except uh, with a, with a slight nuance, since we're all about nuance here. Um, it's also about insight and it's also about awareness of one's emotional and visceral state. So, when you're in that other situation, you're triggered because you've been kicked into a complex or whatever your, your trap door was to be having a, an emotional response. When it comes to doom scrolling, it's registering the fact that your activity is causing a reaction that doesn't feel good. So again, we're back to the metaphor of, you know, eat, eat donuts while they taste good, but don't eat them until you feel sick. So when you start to notice anxiety rising, frustration happening, eyes getting tired, uh, a compulsive sensibility to it. Again, that's your ticket to awareness. And then it's your ticket out. It's like, this isn't bringing me happiness at the moment. Now I'm going to put it down. And people really do lose sight of the, um, their own emotional and psychological discomfort. And it's kind of crazy because it's not fun. Like it doesn't feel good, but people carry mm -hmm. on. So it's really just, okay. I acknowledge this isn't feeling good anymore and I'm, I'm putting it away. So people could think of that as a form of just being gentle with themselves, mm -hmm. a bit of kindness yes. towards themselves. And that, that, that's in the moment, right? That's a kindness in the moment. I think that strategically it is also wise to have some boundaries around stuff like that. So, you know, that you don't, you don't go through the day looking at things like social media, you know, find periods where that's kind of what you want to do, like turn your notifications off and make sure that you're making an active choice to go look at something. Don't be responsive to the default settings. 
you know, so there's a macro and a micro view. When you're in it, register it, come out of it. In the micro view, what kind of in- intelligent decisions do I want to make about my use of social media mm-hmm. and technology and try to gently you know, abide by them? Mm-hmm. Sounds like great advice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't always keep to it myself, but it's, you know, it's an ideal. <laughs> well, it's, it's, aspiration. it's an aspiration. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Aaron, before we switch to a dream, tell us a little bit about your book. Right. So uh, coming up on 10 years now, so I'm working on a revised edition okay. now. Hopefully it'll be out by the end of 2024. Um, the book emerged from a very interesting moment where I was uh, Googled by a patient um, while they were feeling quite anxious. This was years ago. Was years ago. I can't remember what it was now, maybe 2005, something like that. And when in a state of um, anxiety it was Googling me because they wanted a sense of the safety that I provided them as a therapist and found a piece of information about me that's kind of interesting, but sort of innocuous involves having found a nine inch centipede crawling up my wall, which is a whole other story (laughs) on its own that had escaped from somebody's exotic pet collection. So it was like a, it was a, it was actually like this global story, you know, North London psychotherapist finds prehistoric (laughs) beast (laughs) crazy (laughs) but because of the state of mind the person was in this was very upsetting for a whole variety of levels that i talk about so i wrote a paper about what it's like to be discovered on google as a therapist called uh tmi and the transference lol a a title i'm very um proud of and i can share that in your show notes (laughs) if people want to see it um and then i thought my gosh you know we had this therapy session like my client and i had this therapy session where we could discuss what had just happened where he discovered an important other person information about them online. So the book actually is not written for therapists. It's applying Mm -hmm. psychoanalytic theory, particularly relational psychoanalytic theory to understand what happens when people go online, how being online, particularly through social media mediates those relationships Mm -hmm. and how we can understand it from a a broadly Mm -hmm. psychoanalytic point of view. For the reasons that we talked about in the beginning, I just think it's really important for therapists to contribute in the broader social scene, not just thinking about how it impacts the the consulting room. Mm-hmm. But it so needs it a was lot really, of updating. It was born out of an encounter with a centipede. Yes, and actually, um, I found out many years later that without my consent, um, there's a story about it on Netflix, in the, the world's most dangerous animals, Latin America edition. <laughs> An old friend from high school sent me a message over LinkedIn saying, Do you know that you're featured in this you know, Netflix special? I had no idea, but they had picked up the original news story. And it's, an, and it, it's and you, was you it actually, actually dangerous? It, it, it's, it couldn't have killed me, but it would have hurt really bad if it had because I caught it. I, took, I put it in a Tupperware and I took it to the Natural History Museum to have it identified, which is how it became a news story. It's all in chapter two. <laughs> Just the <laughs> dynamics of social networking. So uh, there's a teaser if you've ever oh, you know, needed one. That's great. But talk about reactivity. I mean, that's alarming. <laughs> I mean, I think all my, my bells and whistles would go off. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And actually, you know, in discussing it, because I wrote the paper, but I also brought the client in on the paper and shared the paper with them. And, you know, they gave me feedback that I was unaware of. And it was actually I had it hadn't occurred to me that um, that it's dangerous. And this was part of the the provocation. I thought it was more about you know information that I hadn't shared and information that other people knew. And, you know, that's all in there. But actually, it was you know what would happen if something terrible happened to you? And I didn't know. Oh, oh. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it really opens up. It, it, but the, the interesting thing is, you know, this happens between people all the time, right? On Facebook, yeah. on Twitter, whatever. People are getting information. They're having fantasies and reactions, and they're not exploring, for the most part, they're not exploring them. So this was just an opportunity to say, how do we understand those relations from that point of, you know, looking at the relational unconscious you know mm. why are we on there what does it provoke what are, what are we looking for and what are we getting and it asks and hopefully answers some of those questions well and and aaron maybe if if you have it maybe you can provide a link to that original article tmi and the transference i, I do what yes i'd be happy okay, to do great that. okay so we'll we'll put these resources in the show notes but but let's um move onward to a dream if that's okay
Today's dreamer is a woman. Uh, she's uh, 29 years old. She's a dog walker. And here's the dream. I'm in a castle that I know is about to be under attack. It's dark and cold in here. I am gathering up small animals and putting them in a closet to keep them safe. I pull out a magic wand that I didn't know I had and do some kind of spell to lock the closet door. I double check that it's locked, and it is, but then I worry it's not locked strongly enough, and so I go to find someone who can help me lock it even more strongly. I find a professor who tells me how to do it, and I go back to the closet to fortify the door. I check the door again, but this time it opens. I'm now frustrated with myself for trying to fix something that wasn't broken, and I redo the lock as I had originally done. Now I am late to hide myself, and I rush to the basement where I will stay safe from the attack. As I descend the staircase, I realize I'm headed to my parents' basement. I notice a painting hanging on the wall of the stairwell, and I know I painted it, but I don't recognize it. It's better than anything I remember painting, a lively scene of large, colorful bodies dancing. The basement is crowded and chaotic, filled with old stuff and people. I recognize a childhood friend who I know to now be a tarot card reader. I want to talk to her, but as soon as I get close, she disappears into the crowd. I wonder if it's safe to go back upstairs to check on the animals, and I notice a woman coming down with laundry in her arms. I figure that if it's safe enough for her to do such a mundane task, it must be safe for me to go back up. The next thing I know, I am sitting in the dark closet with all the animals I protected. Two ravens, two cats, a teacup, pig, and a small dog. The guinea pigs are missing, and I know the woman doing laundry must have them. I go back downstairs to find her to make sure she doesn't accidentally put them in the wash. She has them tight wrapped in white towels, and I free them from their bind. For context, our dreamer adds, Over the last few years, I've become aware of how much I struggle in relationships. I have a hard time building healthy relationships and an even harder time maintaining relationships. I'm currently in group therapy, which forces me to confront the ways in which I'm terrified of true connection I hide and keep secrets and build tall walls to keep people out when I so desperately want them in and want to be seen. The main feelings in the dream, she says, were fear, anxiety, and confusion. And she adds for additional context, it looks like I associate with my OCD. When I was a kid, I would obsessively check locks, frequently getting up multiple times in the middle of the night, to make sure all the doors in the house were locked. I spent a lot of time in the basement when I was a kid. It was a place I could go to to hide from my family and just be myself. I do paint in real life and studied art in undergrad, though I have a hard time claiming artist as an identity for myself. As for the animals, I do have a cat. I used to have two, but the other one now lives with an ex. I miss that cat terribly. A few weeks ago, I had an encounter with a pair of ravens on a hike. I've never had guinea pigs, but we did have a pair of rabbits growing up who ended up living in the basement as my mom was allergic. I love animals deeply and have always found it easy to connect with them. So, with all this on our plates, uh, where do we dive in? I don't know. I I found this dream really um interesting and and touching too Mm. and i guess deb i'll take a page from your book which is always a good idea (laughs) is um to start with the setting and of course we're in a castle and you know a castle is well you know i I think we all have probably a couple different associations to castles but primarily they're they're fortifications and she mentioned in her uh, context that she recognizes how she builds tall walls to keep people mm-hmm. out. And I immediately thought of a castle. So we're, we're in this kind of, um, you know, castle is in the 
Middle Ages anyway, they were they were easy to defend. They were defensive structures that had walls around them and parapets where you could, you know, climb out to fire arrows from and that sort of thing. So uh, here we are in this kind of massive mm-hmm. defensive structure, perhaps. And it's dark and cold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's got a little bit of a Noah's Ark feeling to it. <laughs> you know, this terrible things going to happen, and we've got to get the pairs of creatures yeah. on, you know, in the ark, and we'll, you know, survive the the, the event. Uh, because I'm I'm so um, suspicious about the dream ego's interpretation of the events when they're happening. Um, there doesn't seem to be actually any evidence that there is an attack. Right. And the casualness of the woman's laundry basket and the basic rhythms of life continue. So I am moved to take that phrase out of the dream and then think of it as just a series of events that are self generated. I, of course, am curious why she thinks she's under attack. Mm -hmm. But this method of, you know, locking up the animals and then hiding in the basement that's just where i go over and over again and of course if she was here we'd ask her associations around all of that and often animals are indicative of our very young traumatized aspects of ourselves although it is positive that none of them seem injured Mm -hmm. all the animals seem healthy enough um, although two of them are bound up in the laundry basket Mm -hmm seemingly uninjured but perhaps even swaddled Mm, Um, mm -hmm. but that she she's got to take them to herself she can't imagine that the mother figure who's swaddling the guinea pigs could possibly do anything good with them or is likely to dump them in the washing machine so there seems to be this distrust Mm. uh, that nobody but she could possibly take care of all these aspects of herself and that's where I go to in my curiosity with the dream is who can she trust? Does she ever trust? Um, but it's all on her. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, it's such a common dream to have uh, an image of a kind of wounded animal, a, a vulnerable animal that you're maybe supposed to be caring for, that you find yourself forgetting about. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that imagery shows up a lot in people's dreams. So I thought it was interesting because this is almost the opposite. Like she's so she's she's so focused on caring for the animals you know which is lovely and and, and in a way it says that her psyche is very attuned she the let me try that again the ego is very attuned to the vulnerable parts of herself however she's locking them away she's locking them away you know with this kind of uh scrupulousness about making sure it's really well locked i thought that was a great association to her ocd which of course is is a kind of elaborate um defensive strategy um so so you know joseph i'm 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 with you in in kind of wondering about uh you know who can she trust and eventually she's in the closet with the animals you know so she's really she's really kind of hidden herself away too I'm interested in the contrast here between all this, um, you know, locking the doors and locking them in a closet, you know, where they're going to be secreted away, and then um, going to the basement, which sounds pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, She goes down the stairwell, and she sees a painting that she's done. It's really terrific, better than she ever thought she was as an artist. Then there are a whole bunch of people in the crowd, including somebody uh, who does tarot card readings. And then the woman who comes down with a basket of laundry. Uh, and my, the contrast between having to lock something away upstairs and the life in the basement, you know, the more instinctual realm, the realm below ground, below consciousness, um, where it, it seems like a better deal. And she says she has difficulty with relationships, but there's 
Seems like a good a good scene going on, uh, an mm-hmm. interesting scene, a lively scene. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. I'm also interested yeah. in just the sequencing of um, it's safe enough for me to go back up and wham, I'm sitting in a dark closet with all the animals. Mm-hmm. So there's a way that even when the ego um, evaluates and says, oh, it must be safe, Something that's not an ego choice puts her back in the closet, because in the beginning it seems very self-determining. It -hmm. seems more like compartmentalization or suppression, that she's Mm -hmm. deciding she's going to lock things away rather Mm -hmm. cognitively, which seems like a a way to survive. But here, as soon as she thinks it's safe, Mm -hmm. then she's locked in the closet. So -hmm. there's something else that's going on that's outside of her reach. Erin, you were going to say something. Well, I, I was actually struck by something you said, Joseph, when you started about the that they're not seeming to be a threat in the content of the dream. And that actually I was struck by, because I'm listening to this dream and I'm thinking of that old adage about, you know, Jungians have Jungian dreams and Freudians. And I was like, this is very, <laughs> it's very Jungian dream, this. I was sort of feeling very excited, <laughs> very excited by it because it's like a dream of self-discovery. And, and it was only when you read the context of the anxiety that, that actually I had a little bit of a juxtaposition like oh this is an anxious dream because it was very exciting to listen to and uh similar resonances to what you were all saying you know the, the, the vulnerable parts of the self being locked away i love the going downstairs and that, that she used to do art and doesn't do art and it's better than she expected so this resource there and i was mm-hmm. very curious about the professor i thought okay this person's probably in therapy i, I wonder <laughs> i wonder if the professor has to do with the therapist mm-hmm. but then also that the professors in her dream so it's a part of her and that she called for help from a trustworthy other after which she goes downstairs to her past where the resources are so i i felt it was a very optimistic dream and in a sense the laundry Mm -hmm. towards the end was kind of like there can just be an unanxious pragmatic Mm -hmm. doing the long you know the, the animals don't have to be locked up there's all this cool stuff in the basement um, so I really like that juxtaposition, though I don't understand it's distressing that she experienced that as an anxiety, that maybe that anxiety is kind of a remnant of the, the fear from when there actually wasn't fear from in the content of the, of the dream. And there were so many resources. You know, um, we're going to have to see what kind of dreams get submitted to the podcast, This Freudian Life, and see if those are... <laughs> You know, I want to pick Lots up of snakes and trains, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to. I want to pick up on something in this dream that I think of as telos. You know, is that this kind of surprising part of the dream that draws your attention, perhaps in a new direction? And for me, in this dream, that's really contained in the painting. So the painting is lively, colorful, and it's a scene of people dancing. Mm-hmm. So it's not only you know better than what she remembered. It it also I'm thinking about it like this little kind of window into perhaps an alternative frame, if you will, where things might be able to be experienced very differently. Where it's lively and it's colorful and it's celebratory and embodied. And and again, I think you know. Similar to what all of you have been saying, there is this sense of like, oh, wait a minute, there's a different, the, the, the dream points to this very different way of being. So the ego is sort of maybe most familiar or comfortable with the closet, but there, there seems to be these something else that's being kind of pointed at here. And so I, I do think there is a kind of optimism in the dream as well. Maybe even a will for it not to be locked, right? So there's just so much trouble locking the door, but you know, maybe the, there's a the door can be locked because there's no emergency, right? On that fundamental level, there's resource. There's not emergency. The door doesn't have to be locked, right? And the the fact that she's chosen to do that with some magical object, which is unlikely to be as successful as just turning the knob or sticking a key in, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that that fantastical play. As part of it but I go to the optimism because if we just look at the beginning and the end of the dream I'm in a castle I know is about to be under attack and I free them from their bind <laughs> just linking the first mm-hmm. and the last mm-hmm. sentence that's great if we imagine that that's and everything in between to get to that point where 
she or some part of her is freed. Yeah. Goes to the optimism that um, several of you have felt around this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Aaron, I think you were getting at this about the professor. It's like she goes to the professor to learn how to lock the door better, but somehow what the professor tells her actually unlocks the door. And that does sound like potentially that's an experience with therapy. It's like, well, I'm going to feel yeah. safer, but actually it's going to help me lower my defenses. It's also that mercurial trickster. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we ask for one thing and then they, we're tricked into um, something else that perhaps is better for us that we can't understand at the moment. You know, I wonder about, um, you know, her reference to her childhood that she associates um, to in, in her comments and that she would check the locks and... Um, patrol the house at night and make sure everything was locked. And I'm thinking about how kids, uh, all kids, all of us struggle to develop um, ego strength. And we're just kids, you know, we're, we're seven or 11 or 15. And um, the world is big and we're not so big. And we're really trying to keep things under control. And uh, here, I wonder if this dream is kind of echoing that that false attempt to keep things under control, all locked up, everything is in order. Uh, the animals are, as you mentioned, Joseph, two by two. Um, but at this point, uh, the basement that she literally retreated to in childhood to be safe is the place of instinctive life. There are people, there's dancing, um, the woman comes down with the guinea pigs, um, the, uh, I'm building on your idea, Lisa, of the telos of the dream, the forward movement of mm -hmm. you, you can relax. Things are okay now. You're, you're not a kid. You have a well-developed uh, sense of ego and ego strength. Um, chill. Go to the basement. <laughs> have your tarot cards read. <laughs> Hang out with the rabbits. You know, speak. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm thinking now. I'm coming. I'm coming over all Jungian. What have you? What have you? What have you done? Um, <laughs> actually, I actually used to be a in my in my old life. I used to be a tarot card reader um, when I was much oh, younger. Really? Professionally, I used to. Yeah. Well, we'll get you um, together with Joseph. Of course, we're meant to be. Oh a yeah, you too, huh? <laughs> Me too. Yeah, it's true. Um, but I do. I do have a soft spot for for Jung. But I'm thinking about the animals again, and I'm thinking about you know the concept of spirit animals, and they're locked up too right so mm. i see also this opportunity linking with the tarot card reading like to, that they could actually lead her you know they're in swat they're swaddled you open that door those animals take you somewhere she's a dog walker right so i'm curious about right. Right. what the animals mean for her on a deep soul level and how those animals can be you know if they're not in a room where they might take her and it feels like maybe outside those castle gates because again mm -hmm. i do get a strong sense of optimism yeah in this dream. yeah and of course if, if we wanted to continue which i think we probably should wrap up but we could we could amplify those animals we could talk about two <laughs> ravens you know there's uh the norse god odin had two ravens that hung out with him and uh, i'm fighting with fire water earth and air and trying to you know the ravens we could put in the air and the pig we could put in the earth but the cat and the dog, you know, I'm having a harder time with fire, <laughs> and, the fire and water there, I'm, I'm, but I'm working at it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's really a very charming dream, even if it's, you know, even if there's kind of this anxious undertone. So we certainly wish this dreamer well. So yes. Thank you all so much. Well, thank you for inviting me in for that. I really enjoyed that. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.